All right, we want to uh, greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are grateful for everyone that is that is here today. All right. Um, let's uh, you know there have been times in my life in the past where um, you know just sitting to myself uh, just living life not thinking about anything not anything bad happening and then uh, all of a sudden um, I notice uh, whenever this would happen I would notice that I was aggravated and didn't know why. And I also understood um, that it was something that I had to be very, very uh, watchful for, being aggravated and um, uh, just for no particular reason, just aggravated. And uh, it wasn't that things wasn't going well in life. It wasn't that... Uh, anything hard was happening in life. I just noticed that uh, at different times in my life that just, you know, just minding my business. And then all of a sudden, I understood I, I could be short, if everybody understand what I mean when I say that. I could be short in this moment. And, uh, you, you know, we want to pray for people today that deal with that. God does not intend for us to... Uh, be aggravated and uh, in life uh, that's not a good thing to to deal with and God does not intend for us to walk around um, in this life just aggravated you know uh, you know uh, because in that in those moments of aggravation uh, now it's not a sin to be aggravated but aggravation will produce sin Aggravation will cause you to have to ask for forgiveness later, you know, and uh, <laughs> from, uh, from people. And that's not God's will uh, for us to be um, aggravated. Does everybody understand what I'm saying now? Yeah, it's not, it's not God's will for us to walk around just aggravated. Uh, not if we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't aggravated. And uh, so nothing... Nothing good comes out of, out of aggravation. Nothing good comes out of it. You know, people, people leave this world every day through being, because somebody is aggravated. You know, a lot of times I think what you mostly deal with it about, uh, you'll see it in traffic. People aggravated in traffic. You know, and they'll blame it on poor drivers and things like that, but the truth be, the truth be told, you, you know, it, it it should be impossible for us to get aggravated with people that we're we're only around for a split second of our entire life. You see, and so we have to know that there's something else going on there. If we can be uh, if we can be aggravated, uh, and I I sincerely believe that it is a it is a spirit of aggravation that we have to really be watchful for and really be careful about and just and just knowing especially because a lot of times people don't deal with it until they don't went way overboard somewhere and have said some things have done some things to damage relationships and to to cause somebody else grief and so it's not God's will for us to walk around aggravated it's not God's will for us to um, to deal with that not if we you know you know <laughs> we shouldn't be aggravated during the week and then come to church and sing <laughs> praises to the Lord. You know, let's sing praises to him uh, during, throughout the week and uh, it may help us with that. And so uh, we want to pray for you all about that because we want um, people, God's people to have victory in that area. You, it's impossible to display the love of God uh, when you're aggravated, you know, and no matter how you try to hide it, uh, people will pick up on it. 
You see, people will pick up on it, and uh, so that's not God's will. So let's uh, go ahead and pray for you all concerning this. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this day, Lord. We thank you for the help that you're sending us today. And God, we ask right now that you will help these your people, Lord, who have come forward to be prayed for concerning aggravation, Lord. We ask right now that your sweet Holy Spirit will rest, rule, and abide in their lives, Lord. And we ask that you will help them to be watchful from this day forward of any aggravation that may come upon them, Lord. And we ask that you will give them scriptures, give them a song to sing, Lord, to help them in their moment, Lord, when this try to come upon them. And we ask that you will allow them, Lord, to have the victory and allow them, Lord, to walk as you've called them to walk, Lord, and have in your Holy Spirit, Lord. We know that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is temperance. And we know, Lord, that you have called us to have a spirit of joy upon us, Lord. And so right now we pray that you will remove aggravation, Lord, and we ask that you will also help them to get to the root of what may have caused aggravation in their lives, Lord. All of the disappointments, all of the things that have taken place, Lord, we ask that you will help them to forgive people that they need to forgive. Help them to forgive circumstances and get over situations, Lord, where it may not have gone their way. So right now, God, we pray over all of these people, Lord, that you will grant them your peace, your mercy, Lord. Give them peace in their hearts, peace in their minds, Lord, concerning aggravation, Lord. Give them peace in their lives, Lord. Help them to accept whatever you may send their way, or whatever you may allow, Lord, so that they can walk in complete and total victory. And God, we thank you so much for all of the souls that are here, Lord, and we pray that you will have your way in their lives. Lord, we say like you said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not our will, but your will be done. And God, right now we surrender our complete will to you that they may have victory. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for the victory. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, you may wonder sometimes how these things come about. You know, the things that we pray for. Um, you know, I, you know, again, I can be minding my business. And just the other day, I guess about three days ago, I was sitting back there in the parsonage, and uh, um, my sons had come over to help me to do something. And uh, I was just sitting there, and just all of a sudden, I felt that come up on me, and I was thinking, what, what is this? Like, you know, I just understood nobody had done me anything. I, you know, I haven't been around anybody to really be aggravated about anything, you know, and so why is this? And so I prayed about it. And uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, that, that's what I want you to pray for Sunday. That people deal with that, and I want you to pray for it. You know, a lot of times, um, you know, the Word of God, when it talks about Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews, it says that he was our, he was our high priest, and he could be touched with, with the infirmities, the same infirmities that we had, which made him a more... Uh, qualified high priest, if that makes any sense, because he came in flesh and he, he was able to identify with flesh by coming in flesh. And so sometimes the Lord allows his ministers to experience those things, uh, to be able to minister to people, to help them, uh, and, and to realize that they need help in that. And so um, my prayer is that you will receive the prayer and that you will receive victory in your life do not accept that when it tries to come upon you. Know that something is off and something is wrong. And uh, don't, you, you know, if you have to, get off to yourself and just begin to worship God. I tell you, <clears throat> worship really helps us. <clears throat> and it's not really meant for us to just worship when we come to church. Uh, we worship God in our everyday life because he's God every day. 
<clears throat> All right, so if you have your Bibles, let's go to the 15th chapter of the book of John. <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about a few things with you and uh, going to share a couple of stories that you all have heard before, that you've heard, and uh, my prayer is that you will see these things in a different light. So the 15th chapter of the book of John. Yesterday, uh, some of the brothers, we were on the property, my sons, we were on the property cutting a tree down. And we had cut that tree down before. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't cut it all the way down. We didn't, you know, we left a few uh, sticks up there and uh, it, it, it turned into a tree again. What was it, two years ago we cut that tree. There were no branches on that tree when we cut it, after we cut it. And uh, you know, it's amazing. You, I, I walked over to that piece of the property and there was a, a tree again. And I was thinking, we're gonna have to cut this down again, you know. And so it's amazing how trees work. You know, I remember when we cut the tree, I was telling my boys, the first time we cut it, I said, this tree is dead. We need to go ahead and cut it, except it wasn't dead. Now, so let's read verse, uh, verse 1. He says, I am the true vine. Isn't that what he say? Now, the true vine, apparently in, in the Bible, uh, I don't know what it's called today, but the true vine is that middle what's coming out of the ground, the stump that's coming out of the ground. So that's what the true vine of a tree is. That is the part of the tree that's attached to the roots that's going down into, the, in fact, the roots grow out of that, and it's going down into the ground uh, to, to, for food, for tree food, for water and nutrients that they get out of the, out of the dirt. And so when you, when you read this scripture, I am the true vine, what it means is I am the main branch. I'm the one that's coming out of the ground. Does everybody see that now? So that's, that's what's coming out of the ground. Now you think of it in this manner, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, which is what makes him the true vine. And he come to life in that manner, see? And so look at he says, and my father is who? The husbandman. In other words, he's the one that's grooming me. He, he's the one that provides my nutrients and things like that. He's the farmer. I'm the, I'm the true vine, and he's the farmer. Verse 2, every branch in me. So what is a branch now? That's what's coming out of the sides of the tree, or of the true vine, what we would call like the stump. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Everybody see that? Now, uh, it, for this to happen, just spiritually speaking, it's almost impossible to be plugged into Jesus Christ and to the true vine. If you're thinking about a tree now, to be plugged into the true vine and not bring forth fruit, you'd have to purposely and on purpose refuse to, to bring forth fruit. So he says now that every branch... Uh, uh, in me that beareth not fruit. So you see where the branch is located? It's in him, see? And if it's not bearing fruit, what does he do? He taketh away. Everybody see that? And every branch that beareth fruit, he does what? Now why would, why would Jesus Christ take away the branches that's not bearing fruit? I tell you why, because they're still eating. So what happens if you, if you know anything about trees, you, you see the branches, uh, you got an apple tree or a plum tree or something like that. Some of those branches, they may not bear fruit. You come out, you know, not every branch should have fruit on it if you have a fruit tree. But not every, not every branch bear fruit. And so what you do is you cut the branches that's not bearing fruit because what they're doing is taking away from the branches that are bearing fruit. They take, they still eating. The branches that's not bearing fruit, they still eating. They just ain't, it's just nothing good coming out of it. 
They just there eating. You see. And so Jesus Christ, he, he looked at our spiritual life in, in the same manner. If you're going to be attached to him, you need to bear fruit. It, you see, you, you need to bear fruit. And then he says, and if you're bearing fruit, what does he do? Give you a popsicle. What does he do? He purge you. Does everybody understand that now? So, so think of it this way. Uh, so every branch has little mini stems coming off of it. And you look at those stems and you see whether or not they're healthy or whether or not they're good for that particular branch. And you can usually tell by looking at the leaves. That this leaf is brown and this leaf is green. So let's cut this little stem off that's got the, the brown leaf because it's no good for that. And so what the Lord is saying to us is, if you're bringing forth fruit, I'm examining your life. And, and I'm looking deep down in there to see what you got in there that's no good for your spiritual growth. Why? Because I want you to even bring forth more fruit than what you've been bringing forth. So, but a lot of times people's mindset is, Lord, I'm bringing forth fruit, just leave me alone. Okay, I'm following you, I'm doing what you tell me to do. I'm bringing forth fruit, that's, isn't that good enough? The Lord said, no, let's cut some more off of there. Let's purge you even more, you see, so you can bring forth more fruit. Does everybody see that now? Look at what it says, verse 3. Now ye are clean through what? So he's, he's telling you what he's using as scissors. The word. He purges you with his word, which I have spoken unto you. Look at what he says. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Everybody see that now? In other words, he's letting us know, don't think that you're doing anything on your own. You can't do anything on your own. You're going to need me. So, in other words, give up your will. Give up all of your own ambitions. If you're going to bring forth fruit in me, it's got to be done in me. You can't do, you can't live the life of Christ outside of Christ. Does everybody see that now? Look what he says, verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Isn't that something? Now, he has to keep making that known to us so we don't think we're the vine. And he's the branch that we're just tagging along. He keeps making that, making that clear to us. He's the vine. We are the branches. Look what it says. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth what? What kind of fruit now? Much fruit. For without me ye can do what? Nothing. I believe that. Verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Everybody see that now? So let me just explain what, what this looks like in everyday life for us so we can know what, what kind of branch we are in abiding in Jesus Christ. You should not be the same person that you were five years ago you should not be the same person that you were a year ago. If you are bringing forth fruit and the Lord is doing what he says in his word, which he's going to do, if he's purging you, your mindset about different things ought to change, your actions ought to change, you ought to be more mature than you were a year ago. Now, when I was in the ninth grade, I took ninth grade classes. When I went to the 10th grade, I didn't take 9th grade classes. I took 10th grade classes. Why? Because I matured from the previous year. And now I could handle what was in the 10th grade. I remember when I was in the 4th grade, I, I made the mistake of riding the bus with a person that was in the 5th grade. Same school. Now, y'all remember the nursing home that we went to uh, uh, last year? So the school was right across the street from the nursing home. That was my fourth and fifth grade class, my fourth and fifth grade uh, school, Pinewood Elementary. And I remember I was on the bus, fourth grade, thinking I was good at math. And uh, I sat uh, next to in a person that was in the fifth grade. And uh, I saw him doing some kind of division I had never seen before. 
And it was long division. I was just, he was doing his homework on the bus and he was working that problem out. And I'm telling you, I almost cried. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I never, they, what are they trying to do to us? <laughs> that, was, that was disheartening to me <laughs> to see. I wasn't looking forward to going to the fifth grade after that one. He was working out a long problem. And he was doing it in pencil. I thought it better be in pencil. <laughs> but I remember at that moment, I still remember that day, just like it was yesterday. I remember from that time preparing my mind, I'm only in the fourth grade. I got eight more to go. It's just going to, some of you heard me say that with Truth Academy, it's just going to get harder. Learn what you're supposed to learn today because it's going to get harder as you continue. You, if you flunking multiplication, your timetables, 12 times 12, you're not ready for trigonometry. There was a reason why when I was in the second and third grade, our teachers made us memorize, memorize from 1 times 1 to 12 times 12. And I can remember my mother, we would have to go stand before her and, and, and say it, you know, and I remember it because she was prepping us for class and we would have to go to class and stand before everybody. And we'd have to say 10 times 10 is 100, 10 times 11 is this. And if we miss it, they say, sit down, come back. You come back tomorrow and try again. And you just walk and everybody says, it's, it's all right. You gonna get them tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> So that experience on that bus that day, it taught me it just gets harder. So I need to take in everything that I can take in today. I need to really buckle down and learn this stuff because it's not going to get easier. Because of course, you know how math is, it's stacked on top of itself. Yeah, it's stacked on top of itself. You learn one, you learn one before you go to the next, you see. And that's the way this is in God's word. God's word is stacked on top of itself. If you don't get this, you're not going to get that. Does everybody understand that now? Yeah. And God's word is stacked on top of itself. And so we have to have a mind. You think about what Jesus Christ told his disciples before he left. He said, I have many things that I want to say unto you, but as of yet, you are not able to bear it. And in other words, it's some things that I got to say to you that you can't handle right now. You would throw up your hands and give up if I told you everything that I want to tell you. You're not able to bear it. But listen, if you stick around, if you keep learning the things that you're supposed to learn, you're going to get to the point where you grow teeth. And you're going to be able to chew on it, you see. You're going to be able to chew on it. And so here, this is what Jesus is saying. If you abide in me, you'll grow. You'll bring forth much fruit. Does everybody see now? Let's go ahead and keep reading now, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Everybody see that? So now he's making it clear to us what it means to abide in Jesus Christ. In other words, abide in his word. Because the first chapter of the book of John says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So abiding in Jesus Christ means to abide in his word. Now, we can say this, and I can send you home, and you still won't know what it means. So what does it mean in everyday life? In everyday life, what does it mean to abide in Jesus Christ? Situations come up in life. And every day we make choices. I, I'll just use this as an example. One day I was uh, in Hendersonville, uh, in Madison, Tennessee. I went to pick up a friend of mine. Y'all know about that situation. And, uh, but he, I was on my way there. No, he was with me already. He was sitting in the passenger seat. And I remember I had a... Uh, we were on that main street there uh, in Madison, 
And uh, I had buckled up my seatbelt, but it was kind of tight, and I noticed that I'm not hardly able to move in the seatbelt. And then, uh, of course, you know how it happens sometimes. Sometimes you, you, uh, when you're buckling your seatbelt and you close the door, you can close your door on some of the slack of the seatbelt. How many of you have done that? And then you have to open the door to, let some, to, to loosen up the slack there. And so apparently that's what I did. So I was sitting at the, I wait till I get to the next uh, red light, and we stop, and I open up the door, and remove the slack, and I close it. And I just happened to look up in the rearview mirror, and it was some demons sitting in the car behind me. <laughs> and I see this lady, this little old lady, she opened up her door and closed it. And I see her little six or seven year old boy in the back seat doing this. I'm thinking, what kind of, <laughs> this is how people get shot. <laughs> Lady, I was just trying to loosen my seatbelt. <laughs> that was, and, and you know, I guess I didn't respond and she opened up the door and slammed it again and just was looking at me like what? And her son in the back seat like, now I'm telling you, I had a decision to make. Because <laughs> I was this close to opening up that, my door again. Because <laughs> God was going to give it superpowers to send all of them to hell. <laughs> I, had to, I don't know what was bothering that lady or that family. I don't know what in the world. I, maybe they didn't eat. They were fasting. <laughs> <laughs> but in that moment, I made a decision to pray for them. Because you don't know me. <laughs> you just got, happened to get the same version of me that day. <laughs> but I made a decision to pray for them. Because I knew it don't, it don't stop with this red light here. They're going to continue on in that. So, you know, and, and I could see, I could tell, the devil has set these people up. They're going to come across somebody that's not going to give them grace. So I, I prayed for them. So when the word of God tells us to abide in his word or to abide in Jesus Christ, that means when we come across those kind of situations, we do what the word tells us to do. We don't just do what we want to do and then ask for forgiveness later. We do what the word tells us to do in that moment. That's what it means to abide in Jesus Christ. Does everybody understand that now? Here, yeah, boys, y'all come up. All, all four of y'all, y'all come up. Three of y'all, uh, come on, all four of you, come on up. Uh, y'all, uh, so, Will, you get in the middle. All of y'all hold hands around Will. So, you see there now, that's what abide, and so go ahead and try to move, Will. That's what God's love will do for you. It keeps you in, within boundaries. You know why? Because outside of these three young men that's keeping him is death, is disappointment. Do you know how many people get hurt behind stepping outside of these boundaries? That's where hurt occurs. When you don't abide in the love of God. When you don't abide in Jesus Christ. So what the Lord has done, he's put his arms around us to keep us from going outside of the confines. Y'all can go and sit down now. Does everybody see? So you imagine just walking through life and things happening. And, and the Lord said, no, no, don't you respond to that. No, you keep your mouth shut. It'll be, it'll, you, you'll get past it. it yeah. I know you feel like you're about to have a stroke if you don't just get it out, but just, just let it go. Brothers and sisters, I've been there. I've done it. I've gotten aggravated and felt like I was self-entitled. No. <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> And then what you're doing after that? Hey, y'all got some bail money? Can y'all come get me out of this? 
<laughs> so the Lord tells us to abide in his word. In other words, get his word on the inside of you so that you'll hear his voice when he's telling you no. Don't do this. Don't respond that way. Respond this way. In other words, get his word on the inside of you so that you can be reprogrammed to respond the way that he would have you to respond. Everybody see that now? Look what it says, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be what? My disciples. Everybody see that? So God don't get glory unless you are bearing fruit. He don't get glory from you. Does everybody understand that now? Let's think of it this way. You go to somebody's house that got fruit trees, and uh, you see how big the plums are on the tree? And what do you do? You tell the owner of the fruit tree, man, you're doing a good job. You're doing a good job, ma'am, uh, with this fruit. What are you doing? How are you getting these big of plums out of this tree? So you're not, you're not worshiping the tree, are you? You're not glorifying the tree. You're glorifying the person that planted that tree. Why? Because it's bringing forth much fruit, and that's what the Lord desires. The Lord desires glory. The world looks at God in a better light when the people who are called by his name are bearing much fruit. People give their lives to God because they see that tree is bearing fruit. They see those branches bearing fruit. People will give their life to the Lord. But if we're self-entitled and we're just going to respond the way we want to respond and just do what we want to do and just ask for forgiveness later because God is so merciful, then how is God getting glory? God wants to get glory out of our lives. There ought to be somebody that know you or that knew you when you were out in the world that can say, you're not the same person. People ought to be able to tell a difference. When, even when you tell your testimony, people ought to be able to say, I don't, it don't even seem like you were that way. That, that is the way people are supposed to respond to your testimony. You're, you know, people ought to, you ought to have to be able to prove. Now, I'm not going to believe that. That's what people are saying. I, I, don't, I don't know if I believe that or not. You don't come across that way. You say, yeah, that fellow that I'm talking about is dead now. Yeah, he's, he's dead, you see. <laughs> so that's, you know, it ought not to be us asking for forgiveness to the world. Forgive me, world. I'm the law still working on me. They ought not to hear that. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? Because <laughs> how are we going to compel them to come to God and we acting ungodly? We're supposed to be above. The Bible tells us, except our righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. We ought to have a good report, brothers and sisters. You see, we ought to have a good report. All right, so let's go and keep reading now. Verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Look what he says. Continue ye in what? Now, I, I, I'm trying to make this as plain as possible. There, y'all stand up again. Y'all do the same thing again. Except, Will, you, you don't stand in the middle. Just let them three do it. Y'all hold hands. So in that circle is God's love. That's where his love dwells, right in that circle. Everybody understand that? Over there, it ain't love. Over there, it's not love. Over there, it's not love. Back here, it's not love. Right here in this circle is God's love. You see where Will is standing? That's by choice. So do you think he feel God's love over there? That's, but that's his choice. And what people do is they claim to live for God, and then they wonder, well, God, I, feel, I don't feel your love anymore. And God is saying that's because it's in this circle. That's the reason why he tells us, abide in my love. In other words, it's your choice whether or not you're going to abide there. And if you don't feel like God loves you, I can tell you it's because you've gotten outside of the circle. 
Y'all can sit down now. Does everybody understand it now? So he's telling us, abide or continue in his love. In other words, a lot of believers, they start off in the love of God and they got all this good feeling and it's just God is just showing himself. And, you know, but what happens down the road? They, they think God done died down. I don't feel it. I just feel like I don't, I don't have a testimony anymore. I don't know what's done happen. I can tell you what's done happen. You didn't continue. God's word tells us to continue. In other words, don't get outside of that love because you're going to feel that way. You're going to feel like you done lost some kind of connection. Does everybody see that now? Now, then he tells us in verse 10, how? If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Everybody see that? Everybody see that now? If you keep God's commandments, you will abide in his love. Everybody see that now? You notice it don't say that he'll stop loving you? This has nothing to do with whether or not God loves you. It has everything to do with whether or not you're in a position to receive it. God don't stop loving because he is love. But people can move away from God and feel like you don't love me anymore. What's going on? God can't help but to love because he is love. But we can move outside of those confines where we no longer feel it. Why? Because we're human. Does everybody understand it now? Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments, and abide what? Everybody see that now? So you see, even Jesus Christ didn't get a pass when he was in this world. He had to abide in his, he had to keep his father's commandments to abide in his love. Does everybody see that now? My wife and I, when we first, before we, I think it might have been before we got married, we made a pact with each other. Because, I mean, we were trying to, you know, both of us had been married and divorced, and we were trying to comb it all through. Well, everything she went through, everything I went through, it ain't, it, that ain't happening no more. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it all. And the pact we made was this. And I can't remember exactly how we worded it, but it was something along these lines. If I look out for you and you look out for me, then we'll never come up short. In other words, if I put you before myself and you put me before yourself, then we will never come up short. Does everybody understand that, that concept there? Now, if you want to know what road uh, divorce lives down. It lives down people just doing what they want to do to please themselves when they marry. The moment I feel like I got to look out for myself because she's not, and she feel like she got to look out for herself because I'm not, that's when we're on our road to divorce. When I, does everybody understand why? Because that means I no longer trust her love for me. And she no longer trusts my love for her. And so we made a pact. I'm going to put myself before uh, yourself, you before myself, and you're going to put your, uh, me before yourself. And we're going to always be in this vein of perfect love. If I love my wife and I put her before myself and she loved me and she put me before herself, then we know we got each other's back. But the moment, the moment, I have to look out for me because she's not and vice versa, that's when the marriage is in trouble. And so God says the same thing. That's the same pact that he makes with his people. If you do what I'm telling you to do, in other words, if you put my will above your own, I will look out for you. It's going to always, always pay off every single time. 
Jesus Christ, just naturally so, when he, before he went to the cross, he was praying that he would not have to go through that. I don't want to go through this. He was praying. Take, if it's possible, if, if, if it's any other way that, this, that mankind can receive salvation outside of me going to the cross, let's try to figure it out. I don't want to, I know I was born for this, but I, look, we right around the corner now. When I was 10, I could say, yeah, yeah, I got 23 more years. That, yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to the cross. When I was 23, yeah, 10 more years, I'm going. Does everybody understand that now? 28, five more years, yeah, I'm, I'm still down, I'm going. Yeah, but when it's time, when it's countdown, 10 hours, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Is, is this what I came here for? So he was praying that prayer. If it's any other way, if it's any other way, but look what the last thing he said. Nevertheless, not my will. Why? Because nobody sees victory in the cross. Not when it's time to bear it. But you know what? God was looking out the other side of it and was pointing him to the other side. What was the other side? I'm going to make your name the greatest name in this earth. What year is it? What year is it now? How do you know that? It's based off of the greatest man that ever walked this earth. It's based off of his life. Even atheists. You can go find an atheist and ask them what year, 2023. How do you know? Where, where, where did time start? How do you know? Oh, Jesus Christ, that's right. The one that you reject, the one that you deny, you're still going off of his birth. <laughs> Everybody see that? God did that for Jesus Christ. Made him the more, most historical, most important historical figure in this world. Made his name great above every name. That name. Is the only name that demons bow to. Amen. That name. But you know why he did that? Because Jesus Christ chose to abide in his love. And any other name that God makes, because Jesus Christ isn't the only name that God makes great. Does everybody understand that? We see different people throughout history. He told Abraham, I'll make your name great. So Jesus Christ wasn't the only one. He was the, he was the one that went to that extent. But there are other names that we read in this Bible. There are other names that God have made great. Why? Because they chose to go ahead and go to the cross to abide in his love. Does everybody see that now? You know, brothers and sisters, everybody is willing to serve God as long as it don't cost them anything. Everybody. Jesus had a whole crew of people following him until he began to tell them what it was going to cost to keep following him. The Bible says many of his disciples left him and followed him no more. So it's easy to go along until you have to pay a toll. <laughs> Make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters, salvation is free. But I'm telling you, there is a cost to following Jesus Christ. And he tells us in his word, count before you even start on this journey, count the cost. Count it. Make sure you got enough to pay it. Does everybody understand that now? My wife and I, we went down to Florida a few years ago. I ain't never seen so many toll roads in my life. We didn't have change. They weren't taking credit cards. Nobody was there. They just say, just drop your change off in the bucket and keep going. Well, we didn't have change. So what we do, we got to keep going, Lord, and we're just going to pray that the Lord will just follow us through here. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. I see y'all got cameras everywhere. <laughs> we just we didn't know about all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just trying to get to my destination. <laughs> oh, but the next month, what did we get? Snap, snap. <laughs> and this your car? <laughs> we 
We got, what, about five or six of those. <laughs> but I tell you what, I was more, I'm just glad I'm not going to jail. <laughs> I'll pay it. <laughs> and then call you, make sure you got your money. <laughs> so when I come back through there, I can get back home. <laughs> So that's the, that's the journey of life, this Christian life. It's free, but there's some, there's some toll roads, some things we're going to have to deny ourselves with, you see. So the Bible tells us to abide in God's love. Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be what? Everybody see that now? Because when you're no longer feeling God's love, you don't have joy. So he's telling us, this is what you have to do to keep joy. Keep his commandments so you can abide there. Verse 12, now he's given us the main commandment. This is my commandment. That ye do what? That ye do what now? How? As I have done what? As I have done what? Everybody see? This is the commandment that he's talking about. So, uh, so let's put all of this together. For you to abide in God's love. You have to keep his commandments. What is at the top of that? Love your brother as he has loved you. You know why? Because love is the end of the law. If I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. I'm not going to commit adultery on you. I'm not going to lie on you. I'm not going to bear false witness against you. If I love you, that love is going to make me a decent person towards you. It's not going to allow me to respond ugly towards you. It's not going to make me open up my car door and slam it again. Does everybody see that now? So if I love you, that love is going to make me behave. Do you know it's impossible to act right without the love of God? Do you know you're going to get off somewhere? Somewhere. Somebody's going to test you. And you're going to act ugly if you don't have the love of God on the inside of you. God is not going to allow you to accomplish his kind of love outside of him. God purposely make people fail outside of him. Because he has to make you know you need him. That's what he's saying. You can't bear fruit outside of me. You can't live this life of holiness, of godliness. You can't live it outside of me. And so he tells us, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as what? As I have loved you. Everybody see that? And then he goes on to explain what does that love look like? What does that look like to, for you to love one another? Verse 13, greater love hath no man than what? This, that a man do what? What does he do now? For who? Everybody see that? What does he do? Lay down, in other words, he put other people before himself. That's what laying down your life looks like. Does everybody see now? Don't tell me you'll die for me and can't take me to the store. <laughs> Does everybody understand that now? Yeah, we'll all die until it's time to die. We'll be just like Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Or in our garden. <laughs> Lord, if it's any, anything, Lord, any way possible. 
if I love you, I'm going to prefer you over myself. Does everybody understand that now? Yeah, if I love you. So that, this, this is what it means to abide in God's love. He said, if you keep my commandment, what my, what's my commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. Does everybody see that? Love one another. Listen, as I have loved you. So that's a big statement. So now we have to look at what did it look like when Jesus Christ loved us? i tell you what it looked like. Could you imagine being in heaven with all of the comforts of the universe? All of the comforts. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. You could just think it and you're on the other side of heaven. You can be everywhere at one time. All of those comforts. And then looking down at mankind and seeing y'all are in trouble. And I got to do something about it. And then, so you keep in mind, God did not live in time like we live in time. Does everybody understand what I'm saying now? He, he don't live in time the way we live in time. So there he was on the outside of time, and he's looking. So wait a minute. Around 1930, electricity is going to come about. They're going to get it together. And, and then they're going to have air conditioners around 1950, 1960. Then they're going to have automobiles. Everybody's going to have an automobile around 1970, 1980, 1990. Computers coming in. I'll be able to keep in touch with folks. You know, they could just send in their prayer requests. I ain't got to walk everywhere. I, I think 2010, that'll be about right. I, I'll go down there then and die for mankind. You know what he did? He chose one of the hottest places in the world with no electricity. No car to take them anywhere. Just two feet and some sandals. And he chose that time, one of the most inconvenient times, when not his own country was under the rule of Rome, the most cruel nation in history. He chose that time. He could have chose 2005, where at least they're putting people to death. They're just putting them to sleep and they're just dying off. I, I, I'll accept the death penalty that way. That's easy. Just going to sleep. You don't know anything. He chose the, the, to be under the most cruelest nation in the world that come up with that demonic crucifixion where you suffocate to death. And you got to pick yourself up to even breathe. And then they standing there with sledgehammers ready to break your knee, knees to keep you from lifting yourself up so that you can just suffocate. He chose that for our sake. In other words, he chose that inconvenience. Does everybody understand that? Oh, but what about us? Oh, you wanna go to the store? The store you wanna go to, I, I'm, I was on my way to the store, I dropped you off at the corner on my way there. Does everybody see that now? I'll, I'll take you to the store as long as it's en route to where I'm going. Why you got to go there? This store, the store I'm going to, they sell that. <laughs> Does everybody see that? He laid down his life. He had the best life ever. And then he had to come down here in our swamp. Does everybody understand that now? Brothers and sisters, if you've ever been over there to the Middle East, it's hard to breathe over there. It, it ain't this kind of air. You ought to thank God for this. Because over there, that sun leaning on you. <laughs> it ain't a cloud nowhere. So he laid down his life. Does everybody see that now? And he's telling us we have to do the same thing. 
we have to be willing to lay down our life and love people the way that he loved them. Does everybody see that now? And you know when you're, when you're off about it. Because after the fact, you have to justify yourself. Well, I ain't even got that much gas. Why didn't they, they should have called yesterday. I went there yesterday. Just repent. <laughs> so when we abide in God's love and we are not living for ourselves, what it does is it open up our eyes to everything that we're supposed to see the way that we're supposed to see it. Does everybody understand that now? Let's go look at something real quick. Let's go to the, let's go to the, uh, wait, wait, wait. Let's read verse 14 of this same script, of this same chapter. Look what he says. That's a big thing to say, isn't it? How dare he? Look what that says. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Isn't that something? Now, you know, in this world, we don't want that kind of friend. So I'm only your friend if I do what you want? No, you're not going to use me. But the Lord was bold enough to make that, that, that statement. You're only my friend if you're doing what I'm telling you. How many of us will try to wiggle out of that? Does everybody understand that? Can you see what's off with that? Like how the world would look at that. So I'm only, I'm only good for you when you can use me. And the Lord said, yes. That's for those of us that don't like being used. <laughs> Does everybody, we better get that out of our mind. How in the world are you going, how, how do you lay down your life without being used? We can cry and scream and snot all day long to the Lord. Use me, Lord. Use me. I'm here for you. I'm your vessel. And then as soon as we get off our knees, somebody's calling. Hey, I got a favor. No, the Lord ain't called me to do that. How does the Lord use you except through people? The Lord don't need to ride to the store. What, does everybody understand that now? What can you do for him in this world? He already got it all. Does everybody understand that? So, so in other words, how does God use you? If he's, if he's self-sufficient, if he's, all, if he's just God by himself, how does he use you and he don't need you? <laughs> he existed before anything existed. So who does he need? So then how does he use us then? Through people. Does everybody understand that? Show bad fruit. Show these people some love so that they want to come to me, so that they want to have a closer relationship with me. That's how. Does everybody understand that now? Verse 15, let's read that. <laughs> it says, henceforth, I call you not what? For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you what? For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Everybody see that? So, so why was it important for us to read that scripture and attach it to this? Because when we are sincere about serving God and about abiding in him, he's going to start revealing all kind of things to us. Well, we're going to know him intimately. But listen, with that knowledge come sacrifice. And oftentimes, people get so far down the road and they say, now nah, just hold up, that's enough. I don't want to know anymore. Because it seems like the more I know, the more it's going to cost me. So no, I don't, I don't want to know anymore. I don't, don't, no, don't tell me that. I'm good right here. Except that husband, man, he's going to come through and he's going to say, okay, so you decide to stop bearing fruit? Does everybody see that now? Do you know trees bear fruit every year? It ain't just one and done. You can't tell the Lord, I gave you fruit yesterday, last year. Now this year is my, my rest time. This is my Sabbath. <laughs> Does everybody see that now? 
So when we abide in God's love, he opens up our understanding to more things. And he takes us beyond things that we would even think about. All of a sudden, we begin to see things the way we're supposed to see them. Let's go look at something now. Let's go to the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew. The fourth chapter of the book of Matthew, and we're going to show you something that maybe you've never thought about. But my prayer is that you will see it today. The fourth chapter of the book of Matthew, we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Everybody see that? Does everybody see that now? What was he? He was led up of what? In other words, the Holy Spirit led him there. Why did the Holy Spirit lead him there? To, to what now? To be tempted. Everybody see that? And do you know what we do? We try to avoid all of that. We try to avoid all of that. Just, no, I don't want no trouble, Mr. Devil. I'm not going to give you any trouble, and don't you give me any trouble. And then I can go to heaven. <laughs> So what does that mean? The Lord is going to lead you in traffic behind some folks closing and opening doors and throwing up gang signs. Does everybody understand that? <laughs> Verse 2, and when he had done what? What did he do now? How many days? And how many nights? Everybody see that? That was a real fast, brothers and sisters. He wasn't fasting from sugar, from bread, from salad, anything healthy. We're going to fast from that and just eat junk food. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? Fast, I'm telling you, folks fast from soda and think they done done something. All of heaven is applauding because you were able to avoid <laughs> that science experiment in a can. They think that under the Lord, I know now. What, what kind of revelation are you going to give me? <laughs> Does everybody see it? And everybody named Mama leaning on Daniel's fast. No, this was a real fast. We're not eating anything for 40 days and 40 nights. Everybody understand that? And I like that I'm glad that he put in that 40 nights so he would, we wouldn't think it was just half a day. I fasted during the day, but at nighttime, I was tearing it up. <laughs> no, 40 days and nights at the same time. <laughs> Does everybody understand? That, so it says that on purpose. Again, you hear me say, everything that's in this Bible is in there for a reason. Isn't that right now? Look what it says. So how many days did he fast? And what? And what was going on after that? What was it now? What was he? What was he now? He was hungry. Wasn't he supposed to be? So that's just in case you think some kind of way he bypassed. In that moment, he got this power from God, and he was able to bypass his stomach. I'm just so spiritual now, Lord, I don't even need food. No, he was hungry. Does everybody see now? He wasn't past some threshold and didn't cross over to, you know, into glory land. He was hungry because he hadn't eaten for 40 days straight. Now, we have to set it up this way for a reason. Everybody see that? Verse 3, and when what? The tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, do what? To be what? To be way what? A basketball? Football, a car, to be made what? Let me, let me stop now. What was he? Hungry. Was it a sin for him? Was it a sin for him to turn stone into bread? Not at all. Not at all. No, that wasn't a sin. Do you see that in the Bible where it's a sin to turn stone into bread if you got the power to do it? Was it a sin? 
So why didn't he do it? He was hungry. Why didn't he do it? To teach us a lesson. To teach us a lesson. What lesson is that? Get out of self-entitlement. That's how watchful he was. He understood, even though I have fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and I'm hungry, I'm not going to run to the refrigerator to reward myself. I'm not going to reward myself because if I do that, it will undo everything that just happened. But we live in a generation today, they fast one day and they eat twice the amount of food the next. Rewarding themselves. The Lord didn't do that. Does everybody see that now? We can't, in this generation, we can't stand to do anything for anybody without us getting something out of it. I, where is my pay? So even in this, he was watchful. It was not a sin for him to turn stone into bread. He had the power to do it brothers and sisters, and had the right to do it. Does everybody understand that? He was hungry. He had a right to do that. He was hungry. But listen, brothers and sisters, the devil will get you in your rights. He'll get you in your self-entitlement. You rewarding yourself because you've done a little something. Does everybody understand that now? So let's think about this today. We fast from midnight to midnight, and 12.01, we're in a refrigerator raiding it. And you have your reward. Does everybody understand that now? I'm telling you something I had to learn. <laughs> you, you fast, you fast. If I don't eat till 9 a.m., that's what time I'm eating. I'm not standing up to 2 o'clock in the morning. So, okay, well, the fast is, thank you, Lord. I got everything. I think I got all the revelation I was supposed to get yesterday. So today is a new day. 2 o'clock is my new breakfast time. <laughs> that's what the devil was trying to do to him. Does everybody see that now? So he did not reward himself because he, had fa he was hungry. He had fasted fully for 40 days and 40 nights. But he did not reward himself. He wasn't thinking about food. I'm going to just keep living. Does everybody understand that now? So what was the devil? It wasn't going to be a sin for him to turn stone into bread. So what was the devil trying to get him to do? Listen, if you don't deny yourself in this, you ain't going to nobody's cross. You ain't going to say, not my will, but your will. Not if you can't defeat food. You're not going to say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Does everybody understand that now? So, brothers and sisters, this is what it looks like to abide in God's love. You go above and beyond. You're not fasting, and, and we're just using this as an example. You're not fasting thinking about the big hamburger that you're going to get when you're done. You're just living. Does everybody see that now? Brothers and sisters, it is not hard to die to self when you practice it on a daily basis. Does everybody understand it now? You know why he was able to go to the cross? Because he had been carrying it his whole life. That cross been on his back. It wasn't just when the Romans laid it on him. <laughs> Does everybody see that now? Yeah, that cross was on his back, brothers and sisters. So we're trying to show you this. Does everybody understand that now? You think about it. The Bible says the tempter came. The devil came and tempted him with that. He would not, it would not have been a sin for him to turn stone into bread and eat it. But listen, brothers and sisters, at the end of every temptation is death. At the end of it is death. You know why? Because the devil knew the body. He understood. If you fast for 40 days and 40 nights straight, don't you try eating nothing solid. People die doing that. Any doctor will tell you, if you fast, and I mean eating nothing, 
for 40 days and 40 nights, you start off eating broth and get you some soup a few days later. But don't you eat nothing solid. Does everybody understand that now? And your body got to get reacclimated to solid food. It'll be just like trying to serve a baby solid food. Solid. They, can, they bodies can't, take, can't digest that. Does everybody understand that now? So you think about it this way. Every time you self entitled. Every time it's the devil just leading you further and further away from you crucifying your flesh when it, when it really counts. Does everybody understand that now? Again, nobody starts off in trigonometry. You start off with one plus one equals two. If you're able to overcome that, that's what this was. One plus one equals two. That's what we just read in this chapter here. One plus one equals two. No, devil, it's, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, I wasn't fasting so that I can eat some big meal after I was done. Do you all know what happened after the Lord rejected the devil's temp temptation? The Bible says that the angels came and ministered to him. The Bible says that the angels came and ministered to him. What does that mean? What would have happened if he had just been ministering to himself? Okay, bread, you be, okay, stone, you become bread. Rocks over here, you turn into meat patties. I'm going to make myself. Does everybody, he had the power to do that. Do you know we miss out on God's blessings because we're blessing ourselves? We miss out on God's rewards because we're rewarding ourselves. I'm going to share a couple of stories real quick before we close. Uh... Back in 1994, most of you have heard this story. Back in 1994, I was, um, of course, you know, you, most of you know that I was AWOL from the Navy. And uh, I had a, what they call a federal warrant out for my arrest. Now, the reason why that the warrant was a federal one was because of the security clearance that I had. I had a top secret security clearance. And so, of course, they were going to hunt me down. And so um, I was AWOL at the time uh, in 1994, the, la the latter part of the year. And uh, I uh, was on my way to my aunt's house on the other, uh, my uncle's house on the other side of Louisiana. And I was riding with a, another auntie of mine. Some of you have met her. And. Uh, <laughs> She had a old station wagon. So I worked that day, and I was sitting in the back seat sleep, and just as sleep as I was tired. And uh, of course, back then I was walking to work, walking five miles in, in uh, each direction. And so uh, I walked to work and then walked back home, and I uh, uh, was tired, and so it came time to leave, and so we, she came by and got me, and it was me and a, a few of my other cousins, and. Uh, we were drive, making that four hour, uh, uh, three and a half hour drive from Covington, Louisiana to Lake Charles. And so on the way there, I would say somewhere in between, uh, probably somewhere in between Hammond and uh, Baton Rouge, I was sitting in the back seat and I woke up and uh, just as soon as I woke up, I saw two angels standing in the middle of the road. Now, I had never seen anything like that. Just standing in the middle of the road. And they were just both just standing there looking at me. And my aunt is driving, you know. And uh, one of them spoke without opening their mouth. And they said these words, just let things happen the way they're going to happen. And so my aunt kept driving. And when it looked like to me, you know, you know, you think about it, now you're in a dead sleep, and you wake up and you see two beings standing in the middle of the road, and you know, you hear that, that's all I heard. The next thing I know, it just seemed like my aunt was about to run them over and I passed out again. Because it just looked like to me, she was about to hit, I knew they were angels, I knew that they weren't regular human beings, if that makes any sense. 
So it just looked like to me she was running them over, so I passed out again. And the next thing that woke me up, <laughs> uh, maybe about, say about 30 miles outside of Lake Charles, was a loud bang. That's what woke me up. And then I feel this rumbling there. And what it was, her tire had blown. So I thought, okay. So I get out the vehicle, me and my cousins, and uh, she had a spare tire in her back. And when I checked it, uh, it was, it was, um, it was um, aired up. But when, when I went back there to check it this time, it was the air was gone out of it. And so now I'm still in my mind. My aunt, she's kind of frantic, wanting to hurry up and get there and, you know, and things like that to our destination. And so in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking about, to me, what just happened a minute ago, you know, because, again, I passed out. You know how that can be. And so I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking, man, what was that about? And so I'm, I'm outside the car looking at the tire, and I said, oh, Aunt Moss, I said, here's the hole right here. And uh, so we, we were in this parking lot, this store parking lot, and uh, she said, okay, we're going we're gonna to get, we're going to we're going to fix it. And so she walked in the store, and she come out with all this gum. And so it's about four of us, and she got us all chewing gum. Chew it, chew it, chew the gum. So we all chewing it. Now plug it up. Now, of course, I'm a grown man. I know good and well, ain't no gum going to fix a tire. I know that. But you know what I'm thinking about? What I was just told. So I'm like, okay, I chew gum, ain't monster, I chew it. So I'm chewing it, stuffing it in, stuff it, stuff it. Come on, boys, hurry up, get to chew the gum. So I'm taking that gum and stuffing it in there. I'm, listen, now, if it hadn't been for what I saw in that street and heard, we'd have, been, we'd have still been arguing about that. No, and the gum ain't going to work, ain't monster. Get in the car. It ain't, you, what you know about it? <laughs> But I'm chewing gum. You know why? Because I'm letting things happen the way they're going to happen. You see, you, listen, brothers and sisters, it took a while for this whole picture to come, come about that I'm trying to paint for you now. So I'm chewing gum, stuffing, that, stuffing it, and we're putting that in, and the gum is just, all, of, all, of, all the car is doing is, uh, the wheel is doing is blowing bubbles. Does everybody understand that now? So then my aunt says, uh, she called me by my full name, John Bolden. John Bolden. Some of you have heard her say that. John Bolden, uh, you drive. So now I know I got a federal warrant out for my arrest. Now, if I hadn't seen those angels standing in the street and one of them hadn't told me let things happen the way they're going to happen, that would have been another argument. Now, no, I'm not driving. You know I'm AWOL. I can't afford that. In fact, I'm standing right here at this store. Uh, you know, I'm not about to get caught up <laughs> in your jailbait car. Because my Aunt Martha, she always rolled dirty. No insurance, no tail lighters. It's going to always be something. Never had insurance. The tag expired. That was just, if the car could roll, that was just good. That was the Lord's blessing. We don't need no insurance. We riding on God's insurance, I guess. So I knew how she was. So I said, no, Aunt Martha, I can see the devil a mile away. You're not about to set me up. But I'm thinking about... Just let things happen the way they're going to happen. So I start driving. We still got about 30 miles to go, and I got to get on I-10. So what it looked like, I'm driving a car with a flat tire down I-10 going 20 miles an hour, just bumping up and down the road. I know it's a setup. So I drive. So what happened, y'all? Them good old sirens. The lights, red and blue lights pull over. And I pull over. Say, can I see your license and insurance, sir? Yeah, he must have, he must have got out the car fussing with him. I ain't got no, I ain't got, I got that. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there thinking, I'm just doing what you told me to do, Lord. So they come and get my information. Because I'm the one driving. Ain't Marcia still out there fussing with the people. Working on getting tickets. And she got about six of them that night. Now, if she hadn't been running off at the mouth, they probably would have let her go. 
the man came back. Now, my, and, and you know, the Lord, the Lord just set that up so perfect. He had two opposite personalities sitting there. Me, I'm, and I'm saying from what I saw. Does everybody understand that, what I'm saying now? From what, when I saw those angels in, in the street, and what they told me, let things happen the way they're going to happen, it completely calmed me and made me know I got to settle down. Other than that, I'd have been arguing just like A. Martha was. So she out there fussing. I'm sitting in the car praying. The man comes back with my license and information. He said, I see you. I want, I want you to know that I see you. I, you got a federal warrant out for your arrest. You know that, don't I? I said, yes, I know that. He said, but because you've been so polite, I'm going to let you go. That one over there is getting six tickets. <laughs> Thank you, sir. He said, but you can't drive this car. You can't, I can't let you get on that interstate with your flat tire. <laughs> and I was thinking, yeah, and the bubble gum, the magic gum that we got back there. <laughs> So we call my uncle, and he comes. He comes with a, uh, and put a spare tire on. Now, you know what's funny? When he got there, the spare tire had air in it. Now, I had tried to put the spare tire on, even without air, because I thought it's better than a blown tire. We can get somewhere and put some air in it. And when I tried to put it on, it wouldn't go on. Now, you know, again, I, I've always been handy, always. So I know how to put a tire on a car, a wheel on a, t on a car. So when my uncle got there, I told my uncle, Todd, that's not going to work. It's not going to go on that. We tried. And so I, he knelt down. You know, of course, you know, uh, the way I was raised, you got an uncle kneeling down, you kneel down with him. You ain't going to be standing up while he's doing the work. So when he knelt down to put that tire on, I knelt down with him. And he slid that tire right on there. And I asked him, Uncle Todd, how did you do that? I, it wasn't going that way. He said, just some faith. He said, just faith. And I'm telling you, that was my first lesson. It don't matter what happened yesterday. Does everybody understand what I'm saying now? Yeah, you can take the same tire that didn't work yesterday, it'll work today. You know why? Because it's time for it to work. So we slid that tire on there. We went on to the... To the house where we were going to spend Christmas. That's the reason why he let me go. I'm gonna let, he said, I'm going to let you go spend time with, with your family, you see. We got there around midnight Christmas night, which just turned Christmas. I spent the day with my family, and uh, all of a sudden I had this feeling that I was supposed to leave. Don't, don't stay there. And so my aunt, uncle, uh, which was my godparents, they were going back to the other side of Louisiana where I was living at the time. And so when I found out they were going, I said, Uncle, Uncle Elsie, Uncle, ain't, ain't, uh, ain't uh, Barbara, I said, can I ride with y'all? They said, yeah, come on. So I rode with them back to the other side of Louisiana, to Covington. Got back to the house, to their house, and uh, I went to bed. And uh, that next morning, my uncle was knocking on the door. Just, well, really that night, knocking on the door. I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, John, they came for you. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, um, he said, after we left, he said, a few hours after we left there, he said, the SWAT team came through looking for you. Because, see, I had that federal warrant. Now, that cop could show me mercy. But, you know, after a while, it was going to get back. It was in their system that I had been found, you see. And so, from what I understand, it was about 50 of them showed up at the house in SWAT gear looking for me. And... You know, they were, because they had the cameras there, thought it was going to be some big bust and all of that. And the whole time, the Lord had outsmarted them. Does everybody see that now? So they thought, now they were there for about three hours looking for me. They thought I was in there. They knew. In their minds, you were just here. We just let you go. So you got to be in here. Who goes spend half a day? of Christmas with their family. You done drove all this way, you gonna spend a couple of days. Except I didn't. 
you see? And so they were there for about three hours looking for me, looking for me, looking for me. I mean, they looking, they looking across the field and they were telling all my relatives, y'all hiding them, we're gonna have to take y'all to jail. You know what my relatives were doing? They were singing gospel music. Singing, why everybody, why the, why the SWAT team looking for me? Yeah, in other words, y'all not gonna bother us. So my uncle said, they, they come looking for you. And so I said, well, yeah, my, I, I, it's about time for me to go back. It's time for me to go back. You know, they don't swamp me this way. It's time for me to go back. So uh, a couple of my uncles who were in the military, Uncle Tar and Uncle Dudley, they came and got me. And uh, they said, uh, you know, you could turn yourself on, oh, you could turn yourself in at the New Orleans Naval Station. I said, yes, I'll do that. So uh, driving down there, of course, you all know the story how I was dressed, I had earrings in both my ears and in my nose. I knew that I had been running from the Lord uh, most of my life from preaching. And so that day, that was uh, December 27, 1994, uh, taking those earrings out of my ears and my nose, I, I told the Lord, I said, from this day forward, I'm your preacher. So I get down there, of course, you, you know the story, just to, to fast forward. Uh, I get down there and uh, I'm checking into the base and I see the last name of this individual that I'm checking into, and I think his name, last name was Jackson. And I said, uh, say, are you uh, from around here? He said, yeah, I'm from a little place called, he said, you wouldn't know it. I said, where are you from? He said, Picayune. And I said, uh, are you kidding to such and such, such and such? They said, yeah, he said, yeah. So basically what it was, my grandmother and his grandfather were brother and sister. So that's who I'm turning myself into. So I'm trying to get you to see why it's important to let things happen the way they're going to happen. So I checked myself in. He said, "Cuz one, you can go uh, get you something to eat. Have you eaten yet?" I said, "No." He said, "Go get you something to eat." So I went to the child hall, and I'm just sitting there eating. And then somebody walk up to the table, and they just asked me, "Are you a preacher?" And I had to remember, yeah, I did tell the Lord earlier that from this day forward I'm his preacher. So yeah, I, I'm a preacher. And they sat down and they began to tell me what they were going through and I began to minister to them. The next day I went to the middle of the base to get my plane ticket. And when I got to that office, it was a different story. And they said, uh, they still say, you John Bowen? I said, yes, I'm just here to get my ticket that my cousin ordered for me. He said, well, I'm sorry to tell you, we can't put you on the plane. We got orders to arrest you on site. Cause you see, I was slippery, you see. <laughs> I had already made the police officers in uh, and Lake Charles looked like a fool, they SWAT team. So they said, we gotta arrest you on site. And he was apologizing. He said, so I'm sorry, I have to ask you to turn around. And oh, that's fine, that's fine. Cause see, by this time, I'm already in that mode. I'm letting things happen the way they're gonna happen. See, so they arrest me. They don't have a naval brig there in New Orleans. They had to put me in the Orleans Parish prison. And that year, New Orleans was the murder capital of the United States. So I was in there with those people. Does everybody understand that now? So I get in there, and I, when I, so they, they march, they take me to that Orleans Parish prison, prison, and I'm there, and uh, <laughs> I asked uh, the man, the guard that was taking me in, I said, uh, sir, because I was aware that all jails for the most part and prisons have a, 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 a Christian community. So I say, sir, can you put me in where you got uh, believers at? He said, no, we're going to put you wherever we got room for you. <laughs> said, All right, I can't expect the red carpet treatment everywhere I go, I guess. <laughs> and looking back on that, I think, who in the world I thought I was? <laughs> Could you put me where y'all serve caviar and steak? <laughs> 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 yeah. I want the steak side of the prison, not the hot dogs. <laughs> so he said, no, we're going to put you where we got room to put you. I said, yes, sir, okay. And I just began to pray to myself. I said, Lord, I know you got me here for a reason. I said, mark your people for me. So he put me in, in that place, in that particular part of the prison, and uh, you know how the Lord marked the people. Everybody that belonged to God had crosses on, you know, that the prison would hand out to anybody that was a Christian if they wanted one. 
And so I, I began to talk with a certain individual there, just talking with him. And uh, he and I, you know, we began to have Bible study together. And he and I be having Bible study, it turned into a couple of more people coming. And then a couple of more people. And before I left that place, I would say it was about 100 people there in that particular part uh, of the prison. And all, all of them were coming to Bible study. And then after that, of course, everybody being gathered around like that, and all of us being on camera, it looked suspicious. So then guess what happened? The security guards began coming to the Bible study and giving their life to the Lord. I was in there, brothers and sisters, with killers, with people who had killed their parents, with people who had stole and mostly drug dealers. A lot of them were on drugs and had killed people because they were on drugs. I was also in there with a young man, I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Marcelo. And if you're from New Orleans, you know that family very well. Marcelo family is the underground mafia of New Orleans. In fact, if you do your research, if you put, put in Carlos Marcelo, I was in there with his grandson. Carlos Marcelo lived during the time of the Kennedys in the 50s and 60s. And he was an enemy of John F. Kennedy and of Robert Kennedy. And in fact, at some point, Robert Kennedy, being the attorney general at that time, because uh, Carlos, uh, Mr. Marcello, was born in France, but moved to Louisiana, you know, and uh, uh, had him arrested because he was a, of course, he was a part of, he was the head of the mafia in Louisiana, in, in, especially in New Orleans. And so he had, Robert F. Kennedy had him arrested and flew him down to Guatemala in a, in a uh, helicopter and dropped him off in the middle of the jungle. A few days later, Carlos Marcello made his way back to Louisiana. A few days after that, John F. Kennedy was shot and killed in Dallas. Not long after that, Robert F. Kennedy was killed. So y'all see where I'm going now. And it has been long suspected that it was because of what they did to Mr. Marcello taking him off and just dropping him off in a jungle like he was a, a piece of dirt, you see. So there I am, and I know this history, and there I am in there with his grandson. Nobody is messing with him. And he wasn't some big muscular man, but everybody just understood. If you, yeah, we'll do 30 years. At least we'll be able to live to do 30 years. But if you mess with this man, and guess what? He came to the Bible study and gave his life to the Lord. When I left there, on my way out now, secret, because uh, this was over the Christmas holidays. I was only supposed to be in there a couple of days. And the people, the guards, they, you know, I just had so much favor with them. They come in and they were asking me, Mr. Bowler, we, we're talking to your base. We're trying to get there. I said, don't worry about that. Well, you know, because they understood what I was in there for. I wasn't this normal criminal that was selling drugs or killing or uh, things like that. I was in there for quitting my job. So they understood, you don't belong in here with this group of people. So we trying to get, I said, don't worry about it. So what, what was supposed to be just a couple of days turned into about a month. I found out later that the whole time I was in there, I didn't even know they had another preacher coming in there, but because it was the holidays, he didn't come. He didn't show up for that whole month. So the Lord had sent me in there. I found out later on that one of the brothers uh, that I was talking to, uh, what I first started talking to, he pulled me to the side. He said, man, I'm almost afraid to tell you this. I said, what you got to tell me? He said, about a month ago, I, after I found myself in this situation, I prayed and asked the Lord to send somebody to me to preach the gospel to me so I can give my life to him. So let's think about this. What would have happened if I had been acting a fool on my way to Lake Charles? No, I'm not putting gum on that. No, I'm not driving your bait car. I would have completely missed God's will for me to be in that place. 
You know, you think about what we talked about last week. You can rewrite history, bulldozing God. You can rewrite history, not abiding in his love. Does everybody see that now? Yeah, you can rewrite it, or you can live it the way God got it wrote out for you. Does everybody see now? <laughs> so you all have heard me share that. I want to share just one more story, just real briefly. Some years ago, my, my, when my wife and I, when we first got married, it was the year that we got married. So we got married in May of 2010. In October of that year, if I'm not mistaken, it might have been August. I think it was October, though. The Lord spoke to me because we were going to Louisiana quite often at that time. It seemed like every other month we were going to Louisiana to see our relatives. But the Lord spoke to me and said, uh, don't you go to Louisiana. Don't go to Louisiana. I didn't ask questions about it. Okay, I'm not going to Louisiana. And I was settled with that, uh, you know. Uh, but I, I told the Lord, I said, I heard you loud and clear. I said, but you're going to have to tell my wife that. I can't tell her that. You're going to have to tell her that because, see, she was just brand new up here to Tennessee. So I said, you're going to have to tell her. And do you know that day, my wife, I think she called me. She said, she was sitting at her desk. She said, you know the Lord just spoke to me and said not to go to Louisiana? I said, well, praise God. <laughs> you give him, where you at? Well, give him glory, right there where you sitting. Because <laughs> I knew whatever it was, it was going to be something. So that was October, if I'm not mistaken. I thought, well, you know, we don't, we don't need to be trick-or-treating anyway. You see, we don't need to be going to Louisiana to trick-or-treat. You know, we don't need to go there for Thanksgiving or Christmas. You know, we can just stay up here. I didn't know what it was about. I want to say it was that day, it, it, I think it was that December that she got a call saying that her grandfather had died. And uh, then we knew. And so uh, she, she began to pack and get ready to go down there. I said, didn't the Lord say don't go? And uh, she said, well, when does that expire? I said, I don't know. I said, but we've been waiting on this. We know we ain't trick-or-treating down there. You know, we don't have to go there for Thanksgiving or Christmas, so I think this is what he was talking about. And just naturally so, she was rattled. And uh, I mean, just, I think that was, I would say, one of the most, if not the most, trying time of our marriage because she was rattled. She wanted to be there for her family and things like that, wanted to you know, see her grandfather off. And I, trust me, I understood. I mean, she was emotional, crying. And I would just hold her and say, sweetheart, we got, we got to do what the Lord's, and she would just take her fist and pound my chest. And I'm like, when does it expire? <laughs> I don't know, ma'am. <laughs> Did the Lord give you a date? Because he didn't give me one. <laughs> so seeing her in that emotional state, you know, and I, I love my wife like any husband would love their wife. I went to the bathroom and I prayed. I said, Lord, you know, uh, I understand you didn't want us trick-or-treating down there. But can we go? And I, I prayed three different days on three different occasions. And the third time I prayed, because she was emotional. She was emotional. I mean, and she was really having a hard time with that. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I didn't hear anything from the Lord. And I just kept praying, like, Lord, please, please, can we do, can we go to Louisiana? Just for this, you know. And that third time that I prayed, I got on my knees. You know, now the first two times, it might have been for an hour. The second time, it wasn't but for a few minutes. The Lord spoke to me and said, no. I've already spoken, and don't ask me anymore. All right, now I got right up off my knees. I went there and I told my wife, I said, uh, you know, I've been praying. You know, I, I didn't want her to think I was being insensitive. So I've been praying and I said, uh, the Lord told me, no, we can't go. And uh, she was sitting in the bedroom. <laughs> she got on the computer looking for plane tickets, but she was going. So all of a sudden, I felt the power of God come over me, 
And I went back in the room and I said, are you grown? I said, I can't stop you from going to Louisiana. You can do what you want to do. I said, but when you get back here, you won't have a husband. You heard the Lord just like I did. In fact, I prayed and asked him to tell you what he told me. Say, so when you get back to Louisiana, when you get back to Tennessee, you won't have a husband here. So that switched it up. She began to think about things. Now listen, brothers and sisters, I've always been a stickler about God's word. I believe if you're going to serve him, especially if he speak to you, if God take time out to speak to you, it's best for you to listen. So I told her, when you get back, you know, listen, now, I'm saying that at the risk. She's already about to press pay. So I'm thinking I'm, this might be the end. But again, I felt that Holy Spirit come upon me and I said it then. I knew if, if she do go and I have to abide by what I've spoken, God will give me grace to deal with it. I didn't want to lose my wife no more than you brothers want to lose yours. So you did. I didn't know why. I, I can tell you parallel to this universe, to that particular universe. <laughs> we were on television up there in Clarksville. And uh, I, would, uh, I would pray and ask the Lord. Usually, I, whatever I would preach, I would put that on the air that week. And so this time, I felt led not to put what I just preached on the air. So I prayed and I asked the Lord, so Lord, what do you want me to put on the air then? And he said, put God's blueprint for marriage, what you, what you, what you all spoke in Louisiana. You put that on the air. So I put it on the air to run there in, in that part of Tennessee. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was the day that she was supposed to, we would have went to Louisiana if we were going. We were sitting watching our program on television, the God's blueprint for marriage. And about fi between 15 and 20 minutes into that program, I get a call. The man called. I pick up the phone and say, yes, sir, can I help you? He said, is this uh, Pastor Bolden? I said, yeah. He said, this you? I said, yeah, it's me. <laughs> you know, that's something I've gone through. People see you on TV and they don't think you're supposed to answer the phone, I guess. So he said, yeah, it's me. And he said, sir, he said, I'm watching your program on TV. He said, I really need to talk to you. My wife is packing up to leave right now. She's packing up as we speak. He said, I really need to talk to you. So I talked to him for a little bit. But automatically, I knew when a woman make up her mind to leave, ain't no man, no preacher, nobody going to talk out of it. So I handed my, my, my phone, the phone to my wife. And my wife said, uh, Get, listen, don't go. Just let me and my husband come by there and talk to y'all. So we went by there that Monday and talked with them. I knew I didn't have no, no gospel to preach to her because men were bad. If y'all understand what I mean when I say that. You know, we all on the same team. So I look like a husband to her. So my wife went there and we saw what the situation was, and that's what the man was telling us on the phone. Sir, he said, we, I think, what, seven children? Seven children, I think two or three grandchildren? He said, we all live in the house, and my wife is about to leave. He said, I don't want to lose my family. So we, when we went to their house, um, that's what we saw, the seven children, two or three grandchildren sitting there, and they're all looking miserable because they scared grandma and mama's about to leave. So I told my wife, I said, I ain't got nothing to say to this woman. And you're going to have to talk to her. So my wife talked to her for about five hours or so. They went to the store, and she talked to him then. And I was telling, and while she was talking to the lady, I was telling the man, look, you need to get yourself together. I said, now, I believe my wife is going to be able to pull this off. But you, sir, <laughs> you need to grow up. You're not a boy. Because he was almost 50 years old being irresponsible. See, you need to grow up. I said, I believe if she, if she was, if she stayed at the word of my mouth, at the word of my wife, asking her to stay, my wife can talk and understand. But you need to grow up. Stop being baby boy. Take care of your wife, your children, your grandchildren. Be a man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. So she stayed and that home was kept together. You know why? 
because the law said don't go to Louisiana. If we went to Louisiana, the family would have been broken up. Ain't no telling what would have happened to the children, to the grandchildren. All of that would have been messed up if we didn't say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Does everybody see that now? So God saw this two months before it happened. It's going to be a family that's going to break up if you're not here to take their call and go and meet them personally, to pray with them and walk them through and counsel them. So don't go to Louisiana. Does everybody see now? But what if we bulldozers? No, I'm going. I, I, it ain't got to be that but a few hours. And I'm telling you, you'll miss God every time. You know, brothers and sisters, the best thing we can do for ourselves is get out of God's way. Get out of his way. Let things happen the way they're going to happen. Does everybody understand that now? Quit trying to witchcraft and maneuver your way through life to get your way. Because the whole time you're missing God, you're missing opportunities to minister to people. Does everybody see that now? I still think about that family from time to time. We stayed in touch with them for a little while after that. And we were able to minister them to them even more afterwards. But, you know, I remember after that, listen, brothers and sisters, it was after that that my wife came to me and said, you know, I need to ask you for forgiveness. I didn't see it coming. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know, I, me neither. But if I know God, I know there's a reason behind it. Does everybody see? And that's the way, brothers and sisters, you might not see the results, but two or three months or years down the road. But if God have told you to do something, you do it. Don't question him. Does everybody understand that now? My prayers, brothers and sisters, we will hear what God had to say today. That's the name of this message. Just let things happen. If we move out of God's, if we move the way God tell us to move, we'll see his glory. If we pay attention to our life, I mean really be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we'll begin to, we can feel when we're moving beyond those boundaries. We'll begin to feel when we're about to make a big mistake, when we're about to get outside of God's will some kind of way. We'll feel it. My prayers, brothers and sisters, you will let God have his way in your life. His way. Remove all of your own will, all of your own way, because we were born with our ways and our will, and that wasn't doing nothing but taking us to hell. Remove all of that and let God have his way in your life. If you let God have his way, you'd be surprised at what God can do with your life. You have to learn to abide in him. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the things that you've spoken to us today. And God, we pray that you will help us to take this word that we've heard and to live it, Lord. Help us, Lord, to get out, get out of the way, to move all of our own will, all of our own ambition, all of those things that go against your word, Lord, or go against your will for our lives. Help us to move those things out of the way. Help us to love our brothers and sisters as you have loved us. Help us to serve them, God. Help us to be true ministers. Help us, Lord, to look for ways that we can be a blessing to others, even when it's an inconvenience for ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for setting an example for us. And God, we pray that you will get glory out of our lives as we continue to live for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, we thank you all for being here today. My prayers are that you heard something that blessed you. All right. That's all now. We're going to dismiss you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.